Microfone. Ao Hello, I thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Charles Ajman, and from um, Amsterdam Medical Center. I'm also the, uh, the vice president for the UFAS section of Migrant Health. I will be chairing this session um, today, and um, we have four distinguished speakers. And this morning, we have a very uh, inspiring um, talk by uh, Professor Martin McGee. Maki, um, so you look at the economic crisis and its effect. Um, this um, evening, you're going to basically take it further and to look at um, human right, um, health and human rights in Europe, um, effect of economic crisis on access to health care um, for migrants and minorities in Europe. Um, so basically, it's going to be presented by four key uh, individuals who is very well known in the field. And they'll be presenting on um, documented migrants, um, undocumented migrants, asylum seekers, um, as well as um, refugees. So you have key four um, areas that you want to talk about. And the first speaker, is going to be um, Dr. Um, Ursula Trimmer. She uh, is the, um, from Vienna, um, University of Economics and Business. She is the co-founder and head of um, Center for Health and Migration in Vienna and a private uh, research institute that works in close collaboration with the university and public health. Um, um, she has tremendous amount of you know, experience. So, She's going to basically talk um, about it. And the main idea is that each speaker is going to speak about 10 minutes. And then afterwards, you have about um, 40 minutes or so to really, really discuss and also give opportunity to the, to the audience to chip in so that you discuss this further. So um, because of time, I'm going to give the floor to Isla. And that, um, they've all promised me that they're going to stick to 10 minutes. So um, I think... Um, we hope that you can keep within it. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I feel very honored to, to start this session today. And I always promise to be very short, and then I tend to talk as long as I can, and I'm not interrupted. But this time, uh, I will stick to the 10 minutes. I promise that. Well, when I was invited to uh, make an input here, and I got the title, Health and Human Rights in Europe, and I saw this question mark behind the title. And I was wondering, well, where does this question mark come from? Because uh, there is, it's very clear that health is a human right in Europe because all uh, European member states have ratified 
uh, the human rights standards. So there should not be a question mark behind that question. Nevertheless, what we can see and what you see here <coughs> is uh, a landscape of Europe uh, dating from February 2013, so this is one year old now. And you see here basically uh, the amount of access to health care for irregular migrants on level of entitlements. And those countries with red dots on it don't uh, allow any access uh, to health care for irregular migrants except emergency, because emergency cannot be denied. And you can see also on this map that most of the, or many of the richest countries uh, in Europe, for example, Germany and Austria, are among those uh, countries who don't allow any kind of access uh, to a regular health care for undocumented or irregular migrants. What you also see on this map, you see the uh, yellow dots, that is countries that allow partial access for undocumented migrants to the regular health care system, and the green ones, those are the countries who allow full access uh, for undocumented migrants on level of regulations. I'm not talking about practices here, I'm talking here about policy regulations. And what you can see here as well is that there is a red dot for Spain. And this red dot is explained by uh, the economic crisis. That's uh, due to the health reform uh, that was implemented in Spain in 2012. And to my knowledge, but of course, uh, the Spanish colleagues here know that much, much better than I do, uh, not all the provinces did implement uh, these regulations. And I guess Andalusia is one of the provinces who did not implement this and still allows access for undocumented migrants on a full basis. And beside that map, I put you uh, the European Parliament resolution that dated from 2011 on reducing health inequalities where explicitly irregular migrants and undocumented migrants are named as a specifically vulnerable group that should be included into health care provision. So this is a fuzzy picture here. I mean, basically, when we think about economic arguments uh, and public health arguments, we can ask the question, does this make sense? Does it make sense to deny uh, regular health care or health care on a regular basis for the most vulnerable group? And when you ask ex experts, and we did that um, in the framework of uh, Asian-European uh, uh, comparative study commissioned by the Asia-Europe uh, Foundation, Singapore, we asked experts from Austria and Italy, these were the European uh, pilot uh, countries in the study, uh, about whether restriction to emergency care helps to save money or whether restrictions to emergency care causes maybe higher costs than access to basic care. And you can see that those experts are rather homogeneous in their opinion. They say that, ex that exclusion may cause higher costs than inclusion. We did not ask politicians here, for example, but we, asked, we did not uh, ask policymakers. We asked health experts from the field of research, but also healthcare management. What they also say is that the denial of treatment not only is doubtable in, its e in economic terms, <coughs> it also puts public health at risk. Uh, so the majority of experts in this Delphi say that exclusion of irregular migrants from healthcare much more jeopardizes public health than it does jeopardize healthcare budgets, mainly because of a higher risk of infectious diseases. Well, and that's it in a nutshell. Uh, what, we can, what we can also see when we look at economic costs, we can prove at least on a, a case, or on, a, on a, a level of cases, of single cases, we can see that there is evidence that economic costs rise with inaction. And I would just like to give you two insights into the study which I was referring to uh, in the last slides. For example, we got one case where a treatment of a very small injury, a blister from a burns on a forefinger from an irregular migrant who was working as a kitchen uh, worker. He had this blister and he couldn't get access, uh, timely access for treatment. He got treatment uh, afterwards, after some time, in an NGO. And at that time, uh, the treatment costs had already altered with a factor of 
with the uh, treatment given in delay. And we have another case in this study where we can prove that the treatment costs for a sex worker infected with uh, syphilis are approximately 140 euros. That's a case from Italy. And we could also show that in a very moderate calculation, these costs multiply with a factor of 35 within just one week of no treatment. So there, are some, uh, there is some economic evidence already that costs of inaction may be much higher than cost of, of action or inclusion. Yeah, and this is my last slide, because what we can also see when we approach practices and when we look on the level of cases of undocumented migrants who seek health care, we can also see that most of them are integrated into a black labor market, where they are exploited, and in many cases where they get their, their health problems from. And I just want to uh, put this issue on the table as well, that maybe those black labor markets may uh, be a pull factor for undocumented migration, which means that there is uh, an area in our societies in, Austri in, in Europe and also in Austria, this uh, slavery index uh, talks about 10, uh, 1,000 uh, cases of slaves, modern slaves in Austria, uh, that makes benefit, economic benefit from undocumented migration to Europe. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. It will really cut <laughs> to the time. Our next speaker uh, is going to be uh, uh, Natalie uh, Simonot, uh, Medicines du Monde. She is the Deputy Director in Doctors of the World International Network. Uh, she's been working for the organization uh, since 1993. And in 2000, from 2008, she's now responsible for the increase of quality of domestic programs in 14 countries um, of the international network, um, but also for the common advocacy and, and communications. Um, I must say that all the um, information about the speakers are in the um, at page 11, so you can read it. Uh, so because of time, you move on. So um, the floor is yours, Natalie. Merci. So, soy encantada. <laughs> eh, gracias a todas. Alors, very quickly, you will read most because uh, we have very little time. Oh no, it shouldn't go like that. Um, so you will read most of it and I will only point a few um, sections. So we collect data on social determinants of health and patient state of health in about 170 domestic programs with most destitute people facing um, a lot of uh, risk factors in 14 countries. And so here we are in Marseille, in a um, health center we have in Marseille, as you see, with lots of different population coming to look for healthcare. So we work not only to provide healthcare, but also to obtain social changes. So we want access to healthcare for everybody following the needs of the patients and not taking care of any administrative status or ethnic origin or lack of uh, financial resources. We don't fight only for laws, we fight also for better practices because this is what changes people's lives in the field. And we want to respect patients and their own decisions on what they want to do. We should never decide what is good for somebody else. We hate it when it's for us. We should hate it when it's for others. And so social determinants of health have proven to be much more influential than personal practices. And these personal practices, which are always pointed out like being the bad practices, sometimes really help people to survive. And we believe that healthcare is a fundamental right. So we want universal health systems based on equity and solidarity, open to all. And in times of crisis, as we've seen since this morning, austerity has been cutting all social nets and leaving most destitute people out. So this is a room with a view on the sea in Almeria. In the social determinants of health that we document, uh, we can see that they're all bad. 
in our data, bad housing is the rule. Um, also, a lot of people think that it's really directly having bad consequences on the health. Then the fact of not having a residency permit uh, means that people are frightened to walk in the streets. They all live under poverty threshold. Half of them can nearly never, never count on anybody's help in case of need. And this is very important for our practices. 76% have lived through episodes of violence. For example, this man is in Greece, and you can see the people didn't know how to design it very well on his back with a knife. But this is the Golden Down sign, and you have the initials of Chrissy Avi, which means Golden Down in Greece, in Greek. So uh, this patient came to us in Athens and is looking at the city. You can imagine how many people were needed to hold that guy down. About the residency status and speaking about categories, uh, we'd like to point out that actually it changes all the time and we know that in real life. People can arrive as undocumented migrants, then they will look and they will request asylum, then they will be a rejected asylum seeker and become undocumented migrant again, and then they can get regularized and then they will lose their jobs and find themselves again as undocumented migrants. So it's very difficult to focus on a status. What we focus on is on uh, people's health. Pregnant women. This woman is a lesbian. She's been forced to marriage, and she, uh, is then, she has become pregnant. She had to leave a country because uh, her family wanted to kill her. About two-thirds of the women, pregnant women we saw in Europe didn't have access to prenatal care before visiting an MDM, Doctors of the World, free clinic. And when they did have uh, access to prenatal care, it was too late for 43% of them. And this is, for example, the bill which has been shown, um, given to this woman from Uganda um, you know, like saying that it cost about 10,000 pounds, which is about 12,000 euros, to, for a complicated uh, delivery, and for a non-complicated one, it's about uh, 5,000 euros. And this is the money she should give if she wants to deliver at the hospital in London. Otherwise, she can deliver at home alone. Vaccination. We all know that vaccination is absolutely essential for the protection of individuals and of the whole population. At best, half of the minors we've seen had been vaccinated against tetanus, hep B, measles, or whooping cough. And in some countries, only a third of the children had been vaccinated, which is really low and which is the reality. So this is why Ushi you know, when we say, is it a human right? Yes, in words, but not always in the practice. So here is a child trying to vaccinate our medical doctor. <laughs> so we've seen that healthcare systems like the one in Spain, which was a universal health system, are being destroyed under the policies of austerity, even though it is a basic human right and exclusion is costly and ineffective, as Ushi just said. And it's in contradiction with all our medical ethics. He is the example, Alpha Pam. People in Spain know him. He was 28 years old, and he tried to go to hospital seven times because he was coughing, and he was so weak that he asked a friend to take him to the hospital last time he went. The only thing they gave him some medicine, but it was too late, and he died five days later. He had a tuberculosis, and all these months where he tried to access care, nobody took care of him because he was undocumented migrant here in this country. There is a big myth about health tourism, and you know that this is one of the reasons which is always put forward by some uh, politicians or extreme parties we can demonstrate that it is not true. 
There is no health tourism, at least among destitute migrants. There is health tourism probably among richer people in Europe. Among the people we've seen, among the reasons for migration, only 2.3% quoted health as being one of the reasons for migration. They had stayed in Europe for about a medium length of stay of three years before consulting in one of our health centers. The three main obstacles to access health care are financial, administrative, and the lack of knowledge of health system, not knowing if they can access the health system. So how can we say they come to get cured because they don't know that they can get cured and taken care of? And 30% presented a health condition that absolutely needed a treatment but was never treated before coming to one of our health centers. So we want to fight for medical ethics. And we really ask all the researchers here to, um, to help us by you know, putting out researchers so that we can have health policies based on evidence and not on fears or scapegoating. I want to show you very quickly. I don't know how I can do that. Up, escape, no? What's the marshal? The video? Oui, juramento. Juro dedicar mis conocimientos en medicina a trabajar por la salud de los españoles y extranjeros con papeles. Juro que dejar en un segundo plano mi ética y mi moral en épocas de crisis financiera. Juro que no interpondré los derechos humanos a las medidas de ahorro o maximización de beneficios. Juro que no utilizaré instalaciones del Estado para diagnosticar a inmigrantes irregulares. Juro que no negaré asistencia sanitaria a nadie, salvo que no tenga NIE ni DNI. Juro que no recetaré medicamentos contra el SIDA a quien no aporte a la seguridad social. Pero sobre todo juramos que todo lo que dijimos antes no lo cumpliremos nunca. La reforma sanitaria pretende que dejemos sin atención sanitaria a las personas sin papeles, pero la salud es un derecho universal. Por eso hemos jurado atender sin discriminar y lo vamos a seguir haciendo. Porque curar no solo es nuestra obligación, sino también nuestro derecho. Apoya la objeción del personal sanitario. Firma en www.derechoacurar.org. Médicos del Mundo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for a very nice, uh, inspiring uh, talk. Um, the next uh, speaker is going to be uh, Diane Coles. Yes. Um, Diane is the chair of the uh, uh, Amar Lipe Center for Interethnic Dialogue and Terms, uh, the most active uh, Roma uh, NGO in Bulgaria. He's uh, also um, a PhD um, a candidate and um, he is basically going to talk to us also about the uh, ethnic minority perspective in relation to uh, this topic that you're discussing too. Thank you. And uh, buenas tardes. Uh, estoy muy contento de participar en este foro magno. Lamentablemente yo no hablo bien español, así que voy a continuar en inglés. Uh, in my presentation, I will argue five things. One is that Roma are significantly disadvantaged in uh, health care, both in access to health and uh, in uh, uh, quality, uh, both in access to quality health care and uh, in the health uh, status. Second is that medical workers share deep anti-Roma stereotypes and uh, this uh, uh, deteriorates additionally the health status of Roma. Third, uh, the economic crisis led at forming European Roma policy, and I will be uh, I will speak more about uh, this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for that uh, EU Roma policy at present does not pay enough attention to healthcare, and finally that it's crucial to include healthcare in the EU Roma policy. Uh, I said. Uh, that it is well recognized that there is deep gap in healthcare between Roma and non-Roma. Um, I can speak uh, one hour uh, for this, but I don't have uh, time. Uh, for this, it is enough just to see uh, a sentence from the EU framework for national Roma integration strategy that life expectancy uh, for Roma is 10 years less uh, compared to the, the other Europeans. 
according to some recent surveys, uh, because of the economic crisis, now the life expectancy is even close to 14 years uh, lower. Uh, community inquiry died by, by Center Amalipe in, in June 2012. Uh, in two municipalities in Bulgaria shows that uh, the percentage of uh, Roma who are not health insured is uh, more than uh, 52%, around 17% are without uh, GP, the illegal payments are more than 42% and uh, so on. Uh, so we can say that economic crisis sharpened additionally all these uh, problems. Um, the medical workers uh, share deep anti-Roma stereotypes. You can see these uh, disturbing uh, figures. Uh, Two-thirds of uh, them, uh, or some, in some cases, three-quarters of them share um, ideas that Roma are lazy and uh, irresponsible, susceptible to commit a crime, and so on. Um, this worsens additionally the uh, uh, healthcare service in Roma community. You can imagine if you perceive someone as susceptible to commit a crime, uh, how effectively you will uh, cure him. Uh, what about the European Roma policy? Uh, I think uh, the economic crisis is something very bad, but it could have some uh, good uh, consequences. And one of them is that uh, during the economic crisis, not only because of the crisis, but European Roma policy appeared. Before the start of the crisis, uh, the EU Roma policy was, uh, the idea was raised only by Roma NGOs. Uh, the European Parliament uh, appreciated the idea, but the European Commission denied it. Uh, and um, four years ago, here in, And in Andalusia, in Cordova, there was the second Roma summit. In 2008 was the first Roma summit in Brussels. If you uh, compare the language used in the documents uh, in the three summits, you can see that uh, in the first uh, summit there was no word for EU Roma policy. The main conception was that uh, Roma integration is a task of the national governments and the European Commission could just support it. Uh, during the second summit, maybe because of the good uh, spirit of Andalusia, appeared the idea for shared responsibility. Um, and now we can say one week ago it was the third Roma summit in Brussels. We can say that now we can see uh, European Roma policy based on three main pillars. Policy pillar composed by EU framework for national Roma integration strategies. Uh, mechanism for annual reporting. Every member state should report to the European Commission every year it's uh, advanced. Uh, Country-specific recommendations on Roma within the European semester. European semester is a very important policy tool. And uh, from 2013, there was uh, country-specific recommendations related to Roma in five countries with significant uh, Roma population. I hope this will continue and uh, will include uh, more countries. We have legal pillar. In December, the European Council uh, approved recommendations uh, for uh, Roma integration. This is soft legislation, but still this is legislation uh, for first time uh, regarding uh, Roma. And it is very important that we have strong financial pillar through the usage of EU funds for Roma integration uh, for the next planning period, 2014-2020, for example, ESF regulation uh, require at least 20% to be used for social inclusion. A proposed investment priority, socio-economic integration of marginalized communities such as the Roma. This is the only ethnic group mentioned in the regulations and uh, so on. What about the health? We said there are uh, EU Roma policy. By the way, in the speech of President Barroso, he also said the same. For the first time, he used the word, we have strong EU Roma policy. And now the question is not whether we have EU Roma policy, but how to make it stronger. That is, uh, in my opinion, good news. What about the health? Uh, healthcare is present in new framework for national Roma integration strategies, I think, in modest way. Uh, it is present also in the Council recommendation in very modest way, just, uh, how to say, uh, one quarter of the page. Uh, I think uh, it is not enough, but they exist in the uh, policy pillar and in the um, legislative pillar. What about the uh, financial pillar? 
Uh, I, I would say that it is almost absent from the financial pillar. That is uh, maybe the most important one. Uh, ESF pays small attention to healthcare and even smaller to the healthcare integration. Uh, what to do? What can we do uh, together? Uh, first, we can advocate uh, for preparing Roma health related country specific recommendation within the European semester. This will, be, this will strengthen the policy attention to healthcare integration. Uh, we can advocate for paying special attention to the implementation of healthcare chapters of the national Roma integration strategies within the annual uh, reporting uh, mechanisms. Uh, we also can advocate for incorporating Roma health integration in the national ESF funded operational programs, and this could happen within the investment priority integration of marginalized communities such as uh, uh, Roma. Uh, in Bulgaria, by the way, uh, the Human Resources Development OP is almost ready. It includes this uh, investment priority and it has uh, three obligatory directions in the, this investment priority. One of them is uh, uh, improving access of Roma to healthcare. So we can say that uh, in Bulgaria, the next uh, programming period, health integration will be uh, financed. Frankly speaking, the, uh, health, uh, the health policy uh, is not well included in the operational program, but health integration uh, is included. And finally, uh, this is uh, like a long-term uh, idea, but we can advocate for Brussels operated program for Roma health integration. Uh, Mr. Soros uh, explained last week the idea that because uh, the countries with the uh, biggest uh, share from population, like Bulgaria, Romania, have the lowest absorption rate. Maybe it's not a bad idea the European Commission to establish special fund uh, uh, for uh, managing uh, Roma integration projects uh, and this fund to be uh, managed uh, direct, directly in Brussels. Uh, I am sure this, this will uh, provide more opportunities uh, for um, uh, Roma integration and Roma health integration in uh, particular. And uh, I will finish uh, with uh, my uh, opening. Uh, economic crisis is bad, but uh, regarding the existence of EU Roma policy, this could have uh, some good news and some uh, good uh, consequences. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and uh, Diane, for um, your presentation. You basically demonstrate that, you know, although the crises are there. This also offers some uh, opportunities. Uh, the next um, speaker uh, is uh, Lilia Hretas Doctor, and she is a senior advisor at uh, Migration and Coordination at the Council of Europe. Um, Lilia has been a, a politician um, in um, Iceland. Um, she is chair of several parliamentarians, so, so um, a very um, strong politician, and then she left um, for this international post. Um, she is going to talk to, um, to us um, about asylum seekers and refugees. So the floor is yours. <coughs> <coughs> Hello. To all of you, it's a great honor for me to address you here today. Um, I would begin by thanking the organizers for this wonderful conference and the terrific job that they have done in putting this together. Um, and thanks to the Andalusian School of Public Health for their strong contribution and voice in this terrain. It's not only a wonderful city, Granada, but also a beacon of light, uh, as is Andalusia, in terms of access to health and healthcare, still, even if we've all seen um, unfortunate uh, and sad developments for Spain, for the rest of Spain, <coughs> as indeed elsewhere in Europe. Now, I come from the Council of Europe, which is an intergovernmental organization um, which 47 countries across Europe are a part of, 28 of which are a part of the European Union. I'm also, as was sa said here, a national of Iceland, so if you have any questions on Iceland, I'm happy to <laughs> answer these as well from a personal perspective. Um, but what I thought I'd do, because 
you are being um, exposed to so much information here uh, during these days, um, so much expertise, and you are obviously yourself such a deposit of expertise. I'm going to do something that I've never done before, which is basically to have only pictures in my PowerPoint, a kind of a, a, a little pause of reflection, shall we say, a little break, um, and just discuss some of the general principles that the Council of Europe is concerning itself with and does work on when it comes to migration and migrants' rights. So I'm going to start with a description from a detention center for migrants. This is from one of the regular reports which the Council of Europe produces on conditions of detention across Europe. Police in border guard stations continue to hold ever greater number of irregular migrants in even worse conditions. For example, at Sufli police and border guard station, members of the delegation had to walk over persons lying on the floor to access the detention facility. There were 146 irregular migrants crammed into a room of 110 square meters with no access to outdoor exercise or any other possibility to move around and with only one functioning toilet and shower at their disposal. 65 of them had been held in these deplorable conditions for longer than four weeks and a number for longer than four months. They were not even permitted to change their clothes. At times, women were placed in the detention facility together with the men. In the purpose-built Filakio special holding facility for foreigners, irregular migrants, including juveniles and families with young children, were kept locked up for weeks and months in filthy, overcrowded, and unhygienic cage-like conditions with no daily access to outdoor exercise. Now, clearly not all detention centers in Europe are this bad. Some are much better, cleaner, give people access to outdoors air. But the fact remains that detention is on the rise across Europe. And with it, a whole range of very serious questions to people's health who are being detained um, under the resp responsibility of our respective nations and Europe as a whole. And along with it, of course, is the fact that criminalization is on the rise. Even if human rights organizations, the Council of Europe being one of them, repeatedly, uh, repeatedly call uh, for the fact being respected that people who cross borders commit no crime. Yes, there may be an administrative fault, but they're not criminals. They should not be treated as criminals. But what remains in reality is that they are actually, in many respects, much less protected inside detention centers and outside, much less protected than what criminal law actually uh, provides with those who have been con convicted of criminality. Now, irrespective of the conditions of detention, the horric, uh, horrific hellhole, I think um, the word was used by a fantastic keynote speaker here earlier today, uh, Professor McKee, in his wonderful speech, thank, thank you again for that. Um, he used the word hellhole. In, in the various hellholes of Europe, um, be they clean or be they filthy, what is one of the consistent red threats that people inside claim is by far the most unconcerning, aside from anything else. It's lack of information, of not knowing, not understanding why you're there, what you've done wrong, how long you'll be there, who you can contact, um, what your reality, uh, what your world is about to be tomorrow or the day after. And I want to mention this because this is actually a red threat outside of detention for 
um, a large group of migrants as well uh, in accessing health care, in accessing being participants of society at large. It's lack of information, lack of empowerment, lack of, even when you are entitled legally to all, well, certain kinds of things, not knowing how to actually access it and not being helped in accessing it. Now, obviously, as was discussed here this morning as well, a lot of people did not get to wait in uh, the ten detention centers of Europe, but died and are dying as we speak along the way. <laughs> and in Europe, there still persists a practice which is in fundamental breach of international law, so-called collective pushbacks, where po people who are trying to approach the borders of Europe are pushed back, uh, not let in, without any individual consideration of their individual conditions, individual stories, or uh, irrespective of whether or not they're making a claim for asylum, if they're refugees, um, escaping horrors within in their home countries and even threats to life, it is still a practice that people are simply pushed back uh, without any individual consideration. Now, if you do get through all this, once you're in, so to speak, within the society at large, then where exactly are you? And again, as was mentioned this morning, it's of course very important to also keep in mind um, that it's wrong to, to speak of refugees, asylum seekers, migrants at large uh, as a group, as just victims. There are lots of um, diverse, a very diverse group, huge resources of strength and resilience and joy, and in fact, of course, based on facts that are continuously produ produced, uh, great contributors to our societies across Europe. Uh, but again, once they're in, and echoing also what was said here before about the fluidity of categories, you're a regular migrant or regular, and then you fall out again, or you're an asylum seeker, etc. Uh, but first of all, racism and xenophobia does not uh, see you as that. It's kind of blind towards whatever your status is. But secondly, even if asylum seekers or refugees have a strong or legal environment in, for example, access to healthcare, in practicality and in reality, the experience of access often proves extremely difficult with very serious consequences. Um, now, you let me know if I'm passing my time limit, mm -hmm. of course. Some categories are better protected than others. Um, all states in Europe are bound um, by the convention of, of protecting the best interest of the child. But even so, as we heard earlier uh, about vaccination, about all kinds of issues that affect children. And let us not forget either that for a child to access health care, well, usually it needs a grown-up to go go with it. If the mother is scared or if the mother does not know how to do it, then well, the child is in obvious trouble as well. We already heard about, uh, a bit about pregnant women in prenatal and, and postnatal care. And these are groups that are, shall we say, privileged, if we use quotation marks. Because um, after you turn 18, uh, there's just a, a very recent report, in fact, by the Youth Department of the Council of Europe and the UNHCR, um, a, a quite a, a number of young migrants turning 18 go into shock, because overnight, whatever protection they did have as unaccompanied minors, uh, however faulty that might be, is dis disappears overnight. And um, 
one of the issues, that I could speak about this for days just like all of us could, but one issue that I have to, have to um, mention here is AIDS assessment, because AIDS assessment is practiced obviously everywhere across Europe, determining whether a young person is 18 or above 18 or below 18, and here the medical professionals, health professionals, play a big role. And I know we have a special side event later on uh, at this conference on AIDS assessment practices, uh, but I'd just like to say that the Council of Europe has done quite a bit of work on this, and uh, to make a very long story short, for example, in the recent study done with lots of interviews of um, two unaccompanied migrant minors in different countries, every single one of them, every single one of them mentioned AIDS assessment as a very negative, demeaning procedure, even traumatic experience on top of everything that they had done before. Um, and I just want to mention this in particular because obviously health professionals often come um, to this procedure when it's, when it's done. Um, beyond 18, again, the categories, asylum seekers, refugees, obviously undocumented migrants, irregular migrants are in the far uh, worst situation when it comes to vulnerability, but the reality of it is that practical hurdles, administrative hurdles, financial hurdles, um, communication, all kinds of hurdles that uh, are there and have worsened for vulnerable groups in the crisis, in effect, uh, make it often very hard to access. Uh, in closing, um, on a positive note, uh, obviously empowerment is possible. There are lots of good practices still that we can quote um, in different places. But one of the things that it does require, obviously, is also a change of self, um, a change in the way uh, we see ourselves as a host society, as um, healthcare professionals, etc. And the cost of exclusion, I want to highlight this in closing now. The cost of exclusion, which was discussed both this morning and then again this afternoon. Um, clearly, there's always that one person, or hopefully, who can make all the difference. But what is really happening is not just individual tragedies uh, in not accessing health care but um, really a, a, a system change, a change in the principles of the way healthcare systems are received. Uh, Professor McKee mentioned the Trojan horse, a Trojan horse, um, and I think that's a very important po point to, to ponder, because once you start normatizing, making, making it normal to exclude, exclude to have a health care of exclusion. This one is excluded, and that one, and that one. Once it, we become uh, insensitive to these kinds of exclusionary measures, then truly something in the system, not just for individuals, but, for, but within the system, systemic base of the health care system is being changed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily, for a very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. Um, now we have um, about 40 minutes, basically, to discuss. I know that it's very late, and many of you are actually doing well. I haven't seen many people sleeping, which is um, quite... Um, exactly, which is very, um, very nice. So I hope that we can keep that spirit up. Um, so now, basically, what you're going to try and, and do is to um, basically move one step up. And you want to engage with the audience. What, are, what do you think? Um, and more importantly, we've been basically detailing out the problems. What are the solutions? What can you do to make a difference in terms of public health perspective? Um, so um, for now, I think that we're going to open um, it to the audience. And the audience um, can ask questions, and then we discuss it, and then we reflect back on what is being discussed. 
So the floor is yours. Please, if you have any question, yes. Sir. And please, if you mention your name and your institute, and please. Yeah. Sure. Hi, my name is Matt Murphy, and I'm actually one of the wonderful people working at the conference. I mean, not, I might not be wonderful, but everybody else who's working the conference is wonderful. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I actually uh, had a question for uh, Lilia, I think, um, who just spoke from the Council of Europe. And something that caught my attention was your discussion about age determination. So based on my experience here in Andalusia and in Spain, uh, the age determination practice that they use is DEXA scans, so bone density scans. And so that involves healthcare professionals and particularly radiologists that are responsible for determining the age of unaccompanied minors. Um, my question is, is, that an, is there any evidence to back up that sort of practice? Does the Council, does the Council of Europe uh, or the, do European institutions have uh, and a standardized way of age determination? Um, and it, are there processes for people who, uh, you know, it's, they're unable to determine their age exactly for um, appeals or other recourses? Because that seems to me to be a very interesting, particular, and difficult issue to manage, especially with regards to lack of documentation. Thank you very much for this question. I'm sure you're wonderful too, just like the rest of the people. Um, well, it's a very good question, and as you say, it's exactly, it's a very difficult issue, and it's quite a, um, a sensitive issue, but the Council of Europe is now really considering um, trying to produce guidelines on how these uh, AIDS assessment procedures should be done if the, the human right of the person, of the young person involved, is to be put at the, the forefront. Um, these guidelines are not yet produced, but the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe has just recently produced a big report on this, and in fact, another one is coming. Um, and to make, a, again, a long story short, um, one of the fundamental uh, issues that we recommend in these determination processes is that it should, just not, it, should, it should not just be health professionals coming to the table. Um, it should not re rely exclusively on such tests as you mentioned. It should never be done without consent. Um, and some would go further and say, uh, well, is it, the, is it the, a part of the uh, medical profession or the health professional to do success with no clear medical purpose. Uh, there is not a, a unanimous, uh, a unanimous uh, shall we say, position on this. Uh, yeah, but, but certainly some would uh, contest the fact that a medical test or such serious medical um, examinations are being done. Uh, not only without the consent, but without the purpose of actual medical treatment. Uh, so what is strongly advised is not only medical or health professionals, but social workers, psychologists, and other uh, professionals who are engaged with the, with the young person, uh, that there, it always begins with, a, uh, with interviews of the person involved, that they, their stories are listened to, because uh, some of the young people, uh, young people involved, described as if they, they, they said basically that they felt like they were uh, back to the slave trade, that, you know, where they, where they were being uh, explored without any consideration of, of their personal um, dignity. So, and in, in, in what also is, is emphasized is to give the person the benefit of the doubt that, that no. Um, that this is a, a process which no one can say for sure uh, is right or wrong. So um, to, I, hope, I hope that answers your questions a bit. 
Um, is the panel, has anybody has uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, one, one little mm -hmm. thing. Oh. Okay, thanks. Uh, we strongly believe that this is typically the type of thing which uh, health professionals should never accept to be doing. Because there is, in bone age testing, there is never any benefit for the child, and this is a very intrusive test, and medicine is not to harm, and medicine is not a way of controlling immigration. This is not what medicine is about. Any more questions? Yeah, there is um, one hand here over there. Here, a gentleman at the back here. It's just a commentary to this. Uh, I would like just to, to uh, uh, advert this uh, workshop number 10 tomorrow <laughs> with the title Ethics, Human Rights and Science as a Basis to Resist Political Exploitation of Medicine in the Case of Age Assessment of Unaccompanied Minors, where we will discuss more about these <laughs> issues and also uh, tell about the experience uh, in s from Sweden where the Pediatric Association have worked with these tools to, to, m to make a change or to press for a change and uh, have s we have succeeded at least to some extent uh, so far so we will tell you more about that tomorrow. Excellent, thank you. There's a gentleman just there, yeah. Okay. Lawrence Crew from Scotland. Uh, I'd like to take issue with an important statement that uh, Natalie made at the beginning of our presentation where I think she said that uh, your social and economic circumstances were more important than your risk behavior. Uh, in Scotland we have been able to, I think for virtually the first time in any published work to look at the long term of a large cohort of people where we were able to separate their socioeconomic position from their smoking status and their gender. And to our great surprise, we found that over a 30-year follow-up period, their smoking status had a far greater effect on their mortality rate and survival than their social position. And affluent smokers uh, had much higher mortality rates than the most disadvantaged non-smokers, especially for women. And I think it is the case that in acute situations like some of those that we've seen uh, presented today, then your social positions where they are extreme have a very great effect on uh, their health. But in the longer term, I think we have to be very wary about a statement such as that. Uh, particularly, for instance, if people get involved in drug misuse uh, as a result of their situation, that can have a devastating effect. Or if we often see people uh, get infected with HIV because of their sexual behavior where they might have been uh, not given any preventive advice, which will have a lifelong effect uh, and can kill them uh, very early, particularly if they don't get treatment. So I wouldn't be so confident about making such an assertion uh, because I don't think it's always the reality. Thank you. I, I'm not making uh, publicity for smoking and drinking or injecting drugs. I'm not. What I'm saying is that when your life is like it is, when you live in the streets or never know where you will sleep on the next day, it is a help for a lot of people to have these practices. This is all what we say, what I'm saying. And when their life improves, when they get a flat, when they get a normal way of life, you know, then they can get the strength to maybe change of practices. But we can't put everything on somebody's head. And at least this is what we've learned by working in the streets uh, with the people, whether they are drug users or not. And you know this is all. And I do know the consequences on the long term, and we know that. But you know, I think that by helping people getting normal, decent, decent conditions to live, then they will get the power to control the practices themselves.
Yeah, uh, Martin McKay, I'd like to pick up on Lawrence's point because I think maybe there is something more to be said. I think, Lawrence, you're absolutely right. Uh, that does not mean that it's victim blaming. Absolutely, it's not victim blaming. We, of course, understand the circumstances, but we should be absolutely clear that much of the health disadvantage is caused by identifiable biological risk factors for all sorts of reasons. But the, uh, unfortunately, somehow or other, the argument that it's psychosocial stress or something like that has has got a, a, a credence which it really does not deserve. And I think what it tells us is that as well as tackling all of the broader determinants of health, we need to recognize who the real enemy is as among the other enemies that we face, and that are the corporate interests in the tobacco industry, uh, who bear a big responsibility because they do contribute to very much to the, uh, the socioeconomic divide in health. So it's not saying that we should do one or the other. But let's not forget that we have an industry which has killed millions of people in the 20th century and which is continuing to do so and exploiting vulnerable people. Uh, my name is Federico de Montalvo. I am, a, I am not a professional of health. I am an outsider because I am a professor of health law and professor of constitutional law. I am the Vice President of the Spanish Commission for, for Bioethics. I am going to talk because the title of the conference is very interesting. It's right, Health and Human Right of, in Europe. And I think that the legal perspective is important because if we are going to accept that right to health is a human right, at the, at the end we are accepting that the judges will have the last word about it. And this is a problem because human rights are, are directly enforceable in front of the judges. So perhaps we are trying to say that judges will have the last word instead of the principle of majority. And this is a problem because from legal perspective, human rights is a very clear concept. So this is the question because sometimes judges will decide in favor of rights, but sometimes the judges will decide against the majority. And this is the problem. So I think it's very difficult to say sometimes it's a near social right, human right, and from a legal pers perspective, this is a big problem. In any case, tomorrow we are going to have a workshop about this problem in Spain in the morning, about the Royal Decree uh, 16, 2012, the way to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Just before you, you uh, give it to, I think I would like to, because I think it's, uh, you've made a very important point, and being from the legal aspect part, what do you think, you know, what, what is your view? How should you address it? No, the, the problem is that when you are talking about human rights, you know, the judge will have, the court will have a very specific perspective. One case is case by case. You go in front of the judge and say, I want my right to health. But the problem of the judge is that they don't have a general perspective. It's case by case. And they don't have economic power. If you are going to give them the economic power, at the end they are going to decide about economy. Imagine, is that we have the same problem about right to housing. It's the same problem. If, if I go in front of the judge and say, I want my right to housing, and one judge will give me a free house. And in the future, the government will need to pay for hundreds, hundreds and thousands of houses for everybody. This is a problem. Tomorrow we are going to face a way to solve this. Uh, we, we have some examples in so, uh, so South Africa, in Colombia, in France, even in Spain. There's two ways to solve this. is the principle of proportionality and the principle of rationality. There are only two ways. It's like a balance between this idea that uh, right to health is not a real human right, it's a social right because this is a close link with uh, economy, but also to give some power to the judges to control this because if we say it's not a human right we don't want to give the last word to the judges we are going to have a problem because the government they won't uh, have any limit won't have any limit to limit this right this is the problem that if we are going to give the last word to the judges they can decide whatever they want in the economic field and this is a problem in any case tomorrow we are going to talk about this so if someone <laughs> wants to know about this way, tomorrow is a okay. great chance to. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's a very, very important point. And I was just wondering whether the panel, what, what are your thoughts about this? Because I think this is very, very uh, crucial issue. Because if you want a human right, but you know, if it is a human right, and in the end the judges sitting somewhere else has to decide, then how do you sort of move forward on this? Is the panel, is anybody has. Uh,
Actually, I have no idea. The only thing that I, the only, I guess it, it works. You yeah. can hear me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what we can see is that, I mean, the human right to health is not uh, existing since yesterday. It's existing since the, the 50s for, for Europe. But still, this, this, not, this does not change policies. So I guess to implement this kind of human rights, we have to tackle this from other, from other uh, arguments, so to speak. And I think the one main argument for this will be an economic argument. I guess we need to create a quite robust evidence that economically it does not make sense uh, to exclude that vulnerable population groups from health care. And I have the feeling that what we can see now that there are some attempts to do this on a broader basis. So there are economic models which try to uh, tackle the issue, but these economic models are based on assumptions that are quite weak because they cannot grasp the overall situation of undocumented migrants, of their health-seeking behavior, for example, or of their circumstances they live in. And on the other hand, that is what we are doing. We are trying to uh, approach the issue from the another angle, and that is specific cases that we collect and where we then make a costing of these cases. What are the costs of no treatment? What are the costs of treatment? And if you compare that, we can come to some rational, uh, ratio that demonstrates on a case level that it is economically cheaper to give treatment than not than to deny treatment and I think this is this is one argument uh, which we can hope that it will change something and I fear that if you just look it, at look at it empirically uh, this change is not achieved when you when you talk about human uh, rights. Sorry to say, but this is what we, what we can see and observe. Sorry, I did not hear everything you said, but I think I, I got the gist of it. Um, now, uh, first I want to echo what was already said here, because in a way, based, if you base uh, on what the facts or the data that we do have in terms of economics uh, and how it has been pr produced and it was already discussed here earlier, is that it actually is more expensive to, no, you know, to practice uh, systems of exclusion in the end, in the end, in the long term. Um, but aside from that, leaving that aside, um, I would take issue with a statement saying that a social right is not a human right. Uh, social rights are human rights. Uh, and uh, uh, just since I'm here as a representative of the Council of Europe, I'd like to actually draw your attention to a very interesting international tool at the disposal of Europe. It's in many ways is underused, but 33 countries of Europe have signed it. It's called the European Social Charter, a human rights charter of social rights. And more and more people are, are becoming aware of it and using it domestically to protect social rights of, uh, for example, of, of undocumented migrants and migrant children, etc. Um, but our position would simply be, well, social rights are, my, are, are human rights. True, for example, in the, the, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, um, which is the, the kind of heart of the of the, the legal setting of the Council of Europe, the cost has been uh, very, um, shall we say, uh, careful in not Im imposing too uh, many detailed uh, or too broad um, uh, obligations on the states in terms of what, what exactly it should, pro should uh, uh, provide in social care, etc. But also, even in the jurisdiction, uh, the, uh, the case law of the, of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, for example, it, it's, it, is not, um, uh, it is not acceptable to leave, for example, an asylum seeker or an individual uh, or abandon him or her uh, to uh, complete neglect. Um, but so, so this would be, my, this would be my, my initial response to this. I'm Raj, I'm Raj Bhopal from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, one of the benefits of having been to five 
migrant and ethnic health conferences is that I've had five opportunities to get incredibly depressed. Uh, of all the aspects of ethnicity and health and migrant health I work on, this is undoubtedly the most depressing. And we have to applaud the people who work in this area day in, day out. How do you do it? It's amazing. Keep it up. But it seems to me that Martin McKee said something very important today. Uh, the British economy has risen because the number of people in Britain has increased. And it hasn't increased because the British are having more babies. They're not. It's increased because there's more migration into Britain. Britain's a very funny and odd and very difficult to understand country. It's not actually against migrants. Every day, some politician stands up and says, we want migrants, we want young people, we want people with great skills, we want the computer scientists, we want the doctors. In fact, we recruit actively from all over the world for nurses and doctors to work in our National Health Service. So we're not against migrants. Even currently, there's lots of people out recruiting in Bulgaria uh, for the National Health Service right now, looking for doctors to <coughs> put into our A&E departments and other places that the British doctors don't want to work. So it's a very difficult dialogue. And I think there's one thing that we have to confront. All over the world, the, the issue, well, I think firstly, we have to have a new rhetoric. I don't know how we're going to do it. We need our writers and our songwriters and um, some politicians and perhaps networks to start a new rhetoric. Maybe we need a new language. Uh, even the language of illegal uh, immigrant. I know as scholars and researchers and policy people in this field, we try and change it. We call them irregular migrants or undocumented migrants, but the politicians don't. In the UK, the key word that's used in the, in the media, the BBC even, uh, all politicians, is illegal migrant. They don't use the word undocumented. We use it, but they don't. We need a new vocabulary that we can maybe soften things, make, make it. Uh, one of the things we have to portray is that, and it's true, it's not as if we're making it up, the contribution of people is massive and always has been massive and the most successful societies are the multi-ethnic societies in the world at the moment. We have to get that point over and we need people to uh, uh, in alliance with us, but we also have to recognize as people working in this field that the issue of what politicians will call illegal immigration is an incredibly sensitive and very difficult one. And I think we have to acknowledge that too. Um, a lot of what we're seeing today, and we've heard it, other speakers have said it, is the politicians and others are trying to create a deterrent effect. Uh, uh, so uh, others have said it today, <laughs> that people don't want to come. Um, of course, the forces, the push forces are so great. The wars, the civil wars, and all the other things that are happening the, uh, the impoverishment in many countries and the increasing improv impoverishment in so many countries, uh, the inequalities that have been increased. And we have to recognize that too. And I think, I think what I'm asking for, I'm in, a, in a very long-winded way, but I think what I'm trying to say is we need a new rhetoric and we need to somehow or other get over the positive aspects so that counterbalance the negative aspects. And it's not enough for us to try and do it as doctors and epidemiologists and social scientists, we need the really powerful voices uh, alongside us, the writers, the songwriters, the top politicians. We need to get some allies at that level to, so that we can get a more balanced debate. And I hope that maybe in the, uh, probably won't happen for the sixth, but maybe the eighth uh, migrant and ethnic health conference, um, we'll all be feeling cheery when we speak about this topic. Thank you, Raj. Um, I think it's a, this is also um, the point I made, the solutions, and these are part of the solutions, I think. Um, yeah. There is a gentleman over there. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Oh, it's a lady. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Just to, uh, sorry, Lilana Keith from PECOM. It's the Platform for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants, which is a network of organizations working with undocumented migrants um, all over Europe, also all over the world, but mostly in Europe, but we're based in Brussels. Um, just um, a short um, point to add on what was just being said by the previous speaker. I think an important part is also um, addressing the political side by deconstructing 
the myths around irregular migration. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the contribution that people make, but also looking at the reasons why people lose their status. And that the vast majority of the time, the re there's been research done, and particularly for the European Union, the evidence shows that the vast majority of undocumented migrants did not come irregularly. Most migrants have come to the European Union and to Europe in a regular way, but they've lost their jobs, so they've lost their status, often due to exploitation. They've come as spouses or um, partners, but then they've experienced violence or that relationship has broken down and they've lost their status. So it's important also when we're trying to look at what the health needs or what the situation of the people live in who have lost their status, it, it is normally due to some kind of, um, it's another layer of vulnerability where somebody's already had some experience of violence or exploitation, which has caused them to then be in this additional level of vulnerability where then they have even more limited access to services and social support and the care that they need. Um, and then just, I, I hadn't planned to say it, but because you brought up the issue of terminology, mm -hmm. um, PECOM has been working for a number of years on this terminology issue. Um, and we recognize that there is um, no perfect term and undocumented and irregular also can, can have their limitations. Um, and that in, in some contexts, like in the States, we've seen more empowerment with people being able to, to repossess negative terminology. Um, but we feel very strongly from working on this for a number of years with a very broad network that because of the incre like increasingly negative and criminalizing discourse around migration, we have to stop using the word illegal. There are a number of reasons why it is inaccurate, inappropriate, contrary to human rights, dehumanizing, there's so, so many reasons why it's just not correct terminology, and we're not at that point of empowerment with our members and with the migrants that we work with, where we're seeing the language change come, come from them. So it, it has to come from us fighting it. Um, Thank you. But actually, sorry, well, I actually just had a really quick question <laughs> before this discussion okay. started um, about the Roma strategy. Um, it's really interesting, your presentation, and how I understand it is the Roma strategy has always been um, limited to EU citizens and I was wondering because you've been involved in the discussions from the beginning if you could share any insight on whether there was any discussions because obviously as an ethnicity you're not only EU citizens Roma people but how how has that discussion played into the development of the EU Roma policy thank you to answer uh, about the um, national Roma strategies. Um, okay, uh, before uh, 2004 and especially before 2007, the European Union had uh, only few Roma residents. After Slovakia and Hungary, and especially after Bulgaria and Romania joined EU, uh, European Union uh, received uh, millions of uh, Roma residents and since we live in one the same union and the freedom of movement is uh, basic right uh, because of the economic reasons a lot of roma started to move from bulgaria romania to the western countries and in fact this um, this uh, helped the process of uh, preparing uh, eu uh, roma policy because the initial uh, the initial idea of the European Commission was that, okay, the country should solve their Roma integration problem, their Roma integration issue, and the Commission will just support them with some financial means. Uh, after, especially after 2010, after the Nicolas Sarkozy um, attempt to return back in Bulgaria and in Romania some Roma people, it became clear that uh, this is not a national issue, this uh, European uh, issue. And step by step, uh, the European Commission moved from uh, this, uh, this is a national issue to the issue of uh, this is joint uh, responsibility. Uh, now, uh, of course, the idea is that the national council, uh, the national countries have primary responsibility. They should act, but the European Commission is much more uh, active. 
I, I think in the next uh, several years the Commission will become more and more active because at national level there is no uh, strong political will for solving the Roma issue because as Vice President Reding mentioned one week ago, uh, Roma integration politicians just don't want win the, the elections. This is not a popular uh, course. <laughs> And uh, we need uh, stronger European Union uh, pressure, stronger European Union guidance. I will use this Brussels uh, correct uh, term. Guidance, not pressure, but speaking frankly, this should be strong pressure on the national governments uh, and, of course, the EU support to solve uh, this, uh, I would say, European problem because, of course, we, are, we Roma are uh, nationals of Bulgaria and Romania, Hungary and so on, but we are also the biggest European minority. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, just before the gentleman speak, Ursula wants to make a point, so please uh, could you make that and then we move on to that. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to make a point concerning push and pull factors. There is one considerable pull factor for undocumented migration to Europe and that is, I mentioned already, is the black labor market. So it's most likely when you buy nice clothes uh, where it's written in it, made in Italy, this will be made by some Chinese men or women who work under incredible conditions on the black labor market in Italy. This is, this is modern slavery. And what's happening on this black labor market is that somebody takes the labor without paying the costs. In the regular labor market, you take the labor, and of course, but you have to, through the taxes and insurance systems, you, when you exploit the, or when you, use the labor force, you also give something into the system. So you pay the social costs of the labor force. But in a black labor market, somebody takes over the labor and the benefit of the labor, but he doesn't pay into the system. That's what's happening on a large scale all over Europe, and I think we have to acknowledge that as an important pull factor that attracts undocumented migrants to come to Europe and be in slavery there. Thank you. Okay. To the gentleman, please. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question for Natalie. Uh, you showed a very nice uh, video about uh, Spanish doctors who were engaged and who were advocating uh, universal access to health. What is your experience with engaging doctors? And was this a clip um, on behalf of a Spanish society of doctors? Uh, could you mobilize the European do uh, organization of doctors? So could you elaborate a bit on that? Is it possible to engage doctors here? Thank you um, for the question. Yes, it was, uh, the video was made with the medical uh, association um, in, in Spain. And um, what we've seen is that uh, medical doctors, and this is why we were speaking before about changing the practices. I take one example, for example, in Germany. In Germany, there is a real problem for accessing health care for a lot of people, including children, who are considered as undocumented, even though, you know, even when they're one week old. Okay, so they can be denounced to uh, the immigration office. Medical doctors can change that. They cannot change the law but they can change the practice and take care of the people. And this is why we really try to mobilize um, all, not only medical doctors, but all medical professions, you know, nurses and everybody, social, social and medical people, to say, we want people to access care. And in Germany, they have shown that they can change the low stays, but people do access care. And this is also what happened in Spain with a few regions who refused to introduce the law. You know, so I think that when people really refuse to do things, it does work. And when they want to improve um, the system by their own practice and when it's a network, then it has a real weight on uh, also the s political stakeholders I'm sorry, I know we have to finish, but I want to make a little bit of publicity. Mm -hmm. If you can take that outside, you will have the website where you can download all our reports. And you have the main figures. And the next one, which is here, I give you the figures, will be 
on the line on the 13th of May. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone. Just before we, you finish this, I would like to just go around within 30 seconds, take home message. Please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so think about it. Expected. Just about half of that. <laughs> just a, yeah, take home message. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there any take home message that you want us to take home? Just a couple of sentences. Yes, please, yeah. But perhaps I'd just <laughs> like to um, expand a bit on what was said here today about us being so terribly depressed, <laughs> which is so true. But at the same time, mm. um, and this is uh, actually we should do much mm. more of is also speaking about all the wonderful positive examples right. across Europe about what is being do done right, about good practices that are being shared, and about exactly, because you mentioned exactly how this, um, for some reason, when we speak about children's rights or, or women's rights, you know, that's apolitical in a way, but when you, certainly when you speak about migrants' rights, the human rights of migrants, it becomes political. But it, it shouldn't be. It's not about politics. It's about, it's about human dignity and a human right, and I think, Exactly one of the, the, the video that was mentioned just now about how doctors, how health pro professionals, nothing to do with politics, but wherever they are, how, how they can contribute to um, you know, alerting society towards the human rights of, uh, of everyone within our territory, basically. Um, and that, 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 that would be a, a very valuable contribution uh, towards a new rhetoric, really, towards a new kind of paradigm. Thanks. Excellent. But that's a very positive. Anybody else? OK. Yep. Uh, a very simple take home uh -huh. message. Let's talk about those who benefit from undocumented migration. Because if, if nobody would benefit, it wouldn't be existing. Excellent. That's the final sentence here. I hope it will be my <laughs> final <laughs> sentence in the life, but um, I do believe that the European <laughs> Union is uh, based not only on common market, but also on common values. Uh, social inclusion and integration of vulnerable groups like migrants, uh, Roma, minorities are one of the basic uh, European Union values. And uh, it is a good challenge for the Union uh, to do this, to integrate, <laughs> and particularly to improve the healthcare status of uh, these uh, uh, vulnerable groups. This will show whether our union is 50 years old lady, or this is a union that will, be, uh, that will last centuries. <laughs> Thank you. On that note, one word. Oh, of course. Oh, sorry. You want, yeah, yes. Please go ahead. You know, a little bit more of solidarity, <laughs> equality, <laughs> equity, <laughs> and we will have universal health systems. So I say, Salud universal, sanidad universal, yo sí. Excellent. You see, everybody has a nice take-home message, so that's very important. On that note, we thank the panel for a brilliant um, discussion, and also, more importantly, the audience for engaging. I'm so happy to see that everybody is awake, and, and so it's wonderful. So thank you very much for, for your contribution. Thank that's you. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're not easy people. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one word. Uh, later on, we are having the dinner on this lovely spot in the Sacramonte Quarter with the flamenco show and okay, delightful so. dinner. Well, and it will be at so 8.30 much. in La Chumbera. You. And you have the information that there, there are buses going, with, leaving from three hotels. And well, and tomorrow at 9, we'll, we'll meet in here again. Thank you.